My wife is going to shout from the top and say, Heike, did you press the record button? Okay, we're recording. Um, you will see that, obviously, for those of you who know how Zoom works, at the bottom, there's, uh, if you're on a computer, there's a button that says more. Um, the, the chats are open. So please, if you've got any questions, write down the questions there. At the end, we're going to choose a few questions and we're going to answer it. Um, I'm going to ask Leander to, to answer the questions. And... Um, and we probably won't get to all the questions, but of course, we're going to write down who wrote what and we'll get back to you on email. We've got all your email um, addresses and um, I just think, yeah, we're going to have a blessed evening. So so a lot of you um, might know me. Um, some of you might not know who I am. Um, I am currently the ambassador of Creative Kids, proud ambassador. Um, I've been in the entertainment industry for the last 20 years or so. As you know, the entertainment industry, it's hard, it's tough. Um, but I did make the decision to study drama after school. And, um, but I'm also a, an avid entrepreneur. Um, I love getting involved in business opportunities, pioneering things. Um, I've paid a lot of school fees in my life, like uh, I believe most of us do. I've learned some hard lessons. And um, But we've got a few businesses that are doing exceptionally well. My heart is to really empower people and uplift people and give people hope, especially during times as, as, as these. And I was also challenged a couple of years ago in 2010. I was on Survivor Maldives and I won that Survivor and I won a million rand. And let me tell you, it's wonderful to win a million rand. It was hard. It was tough. But it was on that island that I was challenged by, I believe God, I'm a man of faith. I'm not asking you to be a man of faith, but I am to write a book about my story. So um, I started writing the book in 2010. In 2016, it was published. It's this book. And um, it's a story about my journey through addiction and um, mental illness, because I had a huge problem my whole life with fighting the battles of addiction. But it also, it started with my challenges as a child, the belief systems I had, of, of course, all the diagnosis that was given to me, and um, and I ended up in a life, um, you know, that was filled with drugs and alcohol. And this book was my journey and how I got to a place of sobriety. And it was so strange, you know, I wrote the book. It is an Afrikaans Christian book, and it was the first Afrikaans Christian book in 10 years that became South Africa's number one top seller, which was incredible. Then um, it was also, it's also um, translated into the English version. And this version was awarded the Andrew Murray Desmond Tutu Prize uh, this year, which was a great blessing. So it's the same book. But also two years ago, I, I realized the, the, the huge um, level of, um, I don't want to say ignorance, but the huge need out there for parents to understand mental illness and things like ADHD and being dyslexic and, and all of those things. And so I wrote a book about my challenges with ADHD. And mostly, this was the this is my second book that came out, which also did very, very well. And this book was really, um, you know, it's it, it was about, you know, also with my addiction, but all the challenges I had to face, you know, because of all the things that I was diagnosed with. And, um, and how do you marry your faith with what you have been diagnosed with, with a whole bunch of medication and the schooling system and kind of trying to find your way in a society where you feel that you don't fit in, you don't belong. Your whole life, people have branded you as the naughty kid, the kid that had disciplinary disorders and, and a whole bunch of things. And kind of how I had to navigate my way through that, um, you know, through a world when there wasn't the help out there like creative kids today. And um, I mean, just to give an example, in grade two, the teachers used to tell my mother I was going to end up in jail. And I did end up in jail um, in, in, when I was in standard five, grade seven, and I wanted to go to, uh, to high school. There wasn't one high school in the eastern parts of Pretoria that wanted to accept me. Um, we had to literally, um, uh, we had to, uh, the, at, at, at the time, there was the Transvaal um, Educational Department, and we had to um, meet with them and there was only one high school that allowed me to, to enter into the high school under very, very, very strict conditions. Now, as a child, what happened with me was because there was always this, you know, this idea that I'm the crazy kid. Um, I could never fit in. I used to irritate people. I was impulsive. I said the most craziest things. I was naughty. Um, I was branded as, as somebody that, 
that I thought something that I thought there was something wrong with me. So I grew up with this belief system that I'm not worthy, I'm not good enough, I'm not loved, I'm not like my brothers, I'm not like my sisters. I always caused trouble at home. My parents and I didn't get along. I didn't understand what was happening with me. And because of that belief system, I ended up in a life of destruction because that's what people do. If you don't understand your own value, you got to do things that that's going to fall in line with your value system. If you believe that you are worth, um, you know, a, a 10 billion bucks, then obviously you're going to do things and treat yourself as easy. There's going to be selfless self-love. There's going to be all of those things. But of course, you know, that doesn't really happen. And one of the reasons I wrote this book was to explain to people the, the conundrum that the, that the mainstream school system have at the moment. Because in the last 100 years, the school system has not changed. But today you sit with kids that have changed so much the way we process information, the way we, you know, the way we view things, you know, the pressure, social media, you know, all of those things that some kids just don't fit into a mainstream school system. That does not mean that the kids have to be placed on a whole bunch of Medication. Now, just to give an example, I was put on Ritalin and Concerta and all of those drugs, and, and please hear my heart. There's a lot of value to these things, a lot of value when the kid is properly diagnosed and everything else has been done to support that kid. Because in certain countries across the world, you must understand um, medication, especially something like Ritalin, Concerta, Adderall, and all of those things, is the last option. Because it's a very strong drug. It's methylphenidate. It's, it's, it's linked to methamphetamine, which is tick. Uh, please don't get afraid. Please don't get scared. Okay, really, there's a lot of value to it, and you and your child, you know, if he really needs it and it's minister, it's 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 prescribed to him in a very responsible way, he will get value out of it. But because I'm a recovering addict, I couldn't use it, and I got so addicted to it that I ended up in Vescopis. I ended up in Tara. I ended up in you know all these psychiatric wards because I couldn't handle the medication. Yet a doctor prescribed it to me, a psychiatrist. And one of the things in this book. And you can get this book at any Kum books, exclusive books, whatever. And I'll click. I can also send one to you if you if you want one. And you just send your email, and I'll be able to to post you one, and we can work out the fees. It's really not not it's two hundred rand a book, but um, um, you know, it's it's was the one of the reasons I wrote this was to to tell parents that you know there's a big problem out there, and um, and your kid, you know, might be in a mainstream school system. And he might be on a whole bunch of, of, of drugs, but what if you just change your approach to the child? And that's why Creative Kids is so incredible and why remedial um, training and education has really become such a massive, massive big thing because sometimes you just need to change a few things. You change the diet, you change the supplementation. Supplementation is a huge thing, intelligent supplementation. Um, sleeping patterns, you know, what's happening in the house, is there discipline, is there a father figure, you know, all of those kind of things, um, you know, does he do some exercises, but what is the approach at school? Um, and, and here's the thing, a lot of people with remedial think that remedial education is only for special kids, you know, there must be something wrong with the kid, and that's absolutely not the truth. I want to say to you that if your kid has got a label of being labeled ADHD or bipolar or dyslexia, or please, please, that will not determine his future. We are, my wife and I, we've created such an incredible life with us because when, when, when you realize that your kid, it's not a disability, it's not even a barrier. Your kid is just, the way he processes information is it's just different than other people. So if you can just change the approach, treat that kid like a lovable champion, like a like such an incredible human being, you know, where you take all his shortcomings and defects of character and you you make you create strengths out of that. Let me tell you, they become the greatest entrepreneurs out there. They solve problems, they become incredible, incredible leaders, mass awesome leaders and and that's the heart of of creative kids and and that's that's what we do so um i i just want to say to you quickly so i was diagnosed with bipolar one bipolar two depression anxiety chronic adhd um oppositional defiance disorder you know it used to be called dis a disciplinary disorder um conduct disorder people thought i was going to turn out to be literally a psychotic killer that's what people used to think when i was a, a kid and, and often they were Diagnosis that were made that wasn't on par, but as a result, I was put on so much medication and today I'm medication free. I'm medication free. So I want to say to you guys, if you feel like 
there's destruction in your home and your child feels like the antichrist, you know, <laughs> he feels like he's driving you mad. Let me tell you, there's so much, so much hope. Mainstream schools say to you that your child, you know, they really give accolades and they exalt the children that they do very well academically. The ones that don't do very well academically and the ones that are a little bit restless and whatever, you know, they don't get the recognition that they're supposed to get. And that causes a massive problem. You know, in this book, I spoke so much about how, do, how children, how their brains literally work differently than, than some of the children, than how we grew up. So when a child is, is restless and can't concentrate and can't focus and all of that stuff, that does not necessarily mean that the kid has to go on drugs. It doesn't mean that. Today, something that is neglected by parents is actually teaching the kid how to focus. We just assume that the kid has to focus, go to school, kid has to focus and everything. It doesn't work that way anymore. And that's, again, where creative kids fills that gap in the market to love the kids, to give them proper education, to, to, to prepare them for the world out there, to prepare them for mainstream schooling systems as well. But, you know, to, um, to change the approach and really, really get the best from these kids. So with that, I want to introduce Leander Otu. It's been a pleasure walking this journey with her. Leander is an educational psychologist. She's the heart and the founder of Creative Kids. Um, Leander, welcome. It's awesome to have you. And um, please share with us, Leander, just a little bit about your background, literally just quickly about your background, who you are and how did Creative Kids come about? Thanks, Aiki. So um, for the parents who know me, good evening. Um, always good to see you guys. I know I'm not always around and you don't always see my face, but it's always good to connect. Um, and for the new parents, maybe just a very quick background, um, like Aiki asked. Um, I think I always start off and I say where my passion comes from is my personal experience. And I always say to the kids in therapy and at our school, um, you know, I've got ADHD, what's your superpower? And I think the, the great thing that Heike just mentioned, you know, is just that um, we've kind of realized that there's a different approach um, to, to how our kids learn. So I have a very big passion um, for working with kids with learning difficulties, learning barriers. Um, and at the same time, you know, like we said, just kids who just um, process differently and children who don't fit into the box and assisting these kids. And um, obviously I do in private practice, a lot of assessment, a lot of therapy. And about seven years ago, um, you know, I think God really planted a dream in my heart to, to have a safe haven for these kind of learners. And when I say these, I include myself, um, where, you know, our kids can just really flourish and optimally learn. So that's where Creative Kids um, started. And we started as a very, very small school with five learners, um, where we are today, where we have a full class of each grade, over 100 learners in the school and our second campus that is just open in Pretoria. Um, so yes, that's my background in, in the education section with Creative Kids. I'm a mom. I've got a daughter. She's seven years old in grade one. So yes, I'm also doing homework. And yes, I'm also constantly asking, have we brushed teeth? Have we done this? Have we done that? Um, so I live the life that our parents live. And yes, I'm involved with the school in private practice and love being creative, love uh, coming up with new solutions and, um, you know, doing research as well on how we can improve the school and also how we improve the learning of our learners. So I, I think I'm one of those people who would never stop learning. I'm constantly doing some course or busy with my PhD. And, and that's just, I think, really speaks to the fact of when you have a, a challenge, which is, for example, ADHD, it can become your greatest strength. So yeah, that's a bit of background on my side. Uh, Leanna, just for, for the new parents and new people on the school, who does Creative Kids cater for? Okay, so Creative Kids, I think just to very quickly give a wrap um, up of the education se uh, sector in South Africa is that we have our mainstream schools and then we have remedial schools and we have special schools. So mainstream schools, 
basic government schools, basic private schools that follow a full either CAPS or an international IEB or Cambridge curriculum. And then we have our remedial schools that also, for, for the most part of it, a lot of the remedial schools um, follow a full curriculum and others follow an adjusted curriculum, but caters for learners that are cognitively strong and functioning on a really good level, but there's some sort of learning barrier. And when I say barrier, it can be anything like um, whether it is a, a reading disorder or reading difficulty or a spelling difficulty or a handwriting difficulty. Could be something like a visual difficulty, could be an auditory difficulty, could be an emotional difficulty like anxiety, for example. We often have kids that don't cope well because of sensory um, integration difficulties in a big classroom with 40 kids in a class. Um, and, you know, in all fairness, um, at times, it is quite hard for me to also, you know, understand how our kids in general cope in classes with, without per se learning barriers, because it's challenging for them as well. So Creative Kids really um, strives to kind of fill that gap um, of, of still teaching a full CAPS curriculum. So basically the same curriculum as all the other government schools, but in a different way. So our approach is different. Um, we do a lot of internal accommodations. We do a lot of um, exam accommodations and really invest a lot in our learners. So we do weekly remedial sessions with our learners. We do weekly emotional classroom sessions where we do a bit of psychoeducation with our learners. And, and Heike, I think you, you mentioned and you explained so well that we, we really focus on, on our values. So we have um, our creative values and we really try to instill these values in our learners. And at the end of the day, we want them, when they leave our school in grade seven, we want them to embody these values and, and to really feel that they are worthy and that they can go and make a difference and they can become whatever they want to become. Um, but obviously, we strive to equip them with the skills on how to cope with their challenges. So not only do we put intervention in place, but we really, really focus on also helping them with skills. Because at the end of the day, when we leave varsity or we leave college, um, life doesn't offer concessions life is life and we therefore strive to you know install these values in them and, and really help them with these skills as far as possible um, I want to ask you a question quickly so <clears throat> I've heard a lot of parents say or maybe a lot of parents assume or there's this perception out there that putting my child in a remedial school his he or she will probably you know experience a, a almost a degree of less than you know than a usual school um a lot of people assume or have this perception that it's for special kids special needed kids so when i put my kid in that school he's not really going to have the school experience he's not really going to um you know get everything out of what he's supposed to get from school um it's almost as if there's the stigma you know parents a lot of parents you know when i wrote my book i've received literally thousands of emails um, of people and that, that struggle with, it, with with these kids. But somehow when you start talking about the solutions, you know, one thing that parents are afraid of is, well, not afraid of, they have this perception that a remedial school is almost like a special needs school. So first of all, there's a stigma. They don't want to put the kids in there. And also they're afraid and scared that they're not going to get educated like a normal, proper primary school. Mm. Yes, I think that is definitely the stigma that's around it. So um, on the other side, I mentioned the special schools and there's a and there's a, a place for the special schools. And those are often for our learners who are not as academic, but are more technical, who can also be extremely successful in life. Um, but a remedial stream still offers the, the, the full curriculum. Like I said, there are remedial schools that don't, that do an adjusted curriculum. At Creative Kids, um, we believe that our learners can cope with a full curriculum it's a lot of effort it's a lot of work from the parents and from but the there therapist. are small classes and 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 a lot of attention that goes into yeah That's yeah, so um, definitely we offer the full curriculum and, and they can. So the, it's not much different. So I think also when we started Creative Kids, a big thing for me was, um, so everything at the school has got this method behind the madness, that's what I always say, um, in whatever we do, whether it's the way that we design our playground equipment to help the OTs to facilitate and, and to um, assist with, with finding gross motor development, whether it is our school clothes that's a specific technique 
textile to, to help our kids with our with the sensory difficulties. So there's really a lot of thought and research behind everything that we do um, to assist our learners to optimally learn. And um, our classrooms are smaller, like you said. So we do a lot of multi-sensory teaching because our kids cannot, I think a, a, a general, in general, most kids can't sit still for a whole day. I think we expect so much of them. And as an adult, I can't sit still for the whole day. So, um, you know, our kids, for example, in the classrooms, they sit on balls if they need to, or they will stand at a desk, stand and work if they need to. Um, you know, we put accommodations in place to assist them specifically for what they need. Uh, and, and because there's so many different things in the classroom that's available, um, our educational psychologists that are on our team are amazing. Um, and they really work so hard with the teachers and the parents and the learners to see what will work for that child. So it's really just um, providing a specific individual support plan for that specific child that will work for them, but still following the full um, curriculum. So one question I get, I, I, I often receive from parents is what about sport? So my child goes to Creative Kids, um, it is, um, it's relatively small. Um, the focus is, is based a lot about on, on the, on the education, you know, and the way that, that we educate the kids and the approach, but what about sport? What if the child really wants to play sport? What, what do you do? Yeah, so we offer, so obviously because we are a smaller school environment and we have one grade of each, one class in each grade, um, it is often difficult to have the team sport. So, so that for us just practically does not work. So what we do, because we are registered with the department, if a child really does very well in a certain sport, um, we can apply with the Department of Education to facilitate the placement of such a learner with a school in the area. So if there's a government school in the area that the child really would like to join, for example, for rugby trials or netball trials, or that is something that we can accommodate through the department. But a lot of our kids do club sports. They enjoy it so much because they are so active. Um, they are very keen on your action netball and your action cricket and your, your, uh, um, your other sports that, that are offered there. But they also do club sports. So your, your club soccer and all your other club kind of sports. So that covers the sport. But we really try from our side also, and next year is a big year for us. Hopefully COVID is going to facilitate this and, and kind of, you know, help us to get this started and off the ground. But um, to also do other extramurals, so one-on-one -on -one extramurals, for example, arts classes, um, baking and catering classes. Um, so other types of extramurals that our kids can, you know, utilize their, their strengths and their creativity as well. We do very well in the Estate Fit. Um, so we are so proud this year. We had one of our learners be, um, you know, he was a, a, a one of the category winners and competing against schools that have got a thousand learners in a school. That was amazing. And a lot of our learners did so, so, so well. So we're so proud of them. Often our kids are, come to us and they shy and they're very withdrawn and their self-esteem is not too great because they've always been the outsider or always been the child that you know that can't sit still or talks too much I always say to the kids you know the amount of times that I was asked to go outside the class and speak to myself <laughs> because I was talking all the time as a child and um, you know we get that so yeah so we're very very proud of them that they could rise up to the occasion and that they can take part in stuff like that so also cross country we also compete against the other schools in the area um and <clears throat> in the past we have done really well our kids really do well so as far as possible um we do that uh, you know and we try to facilitate the extra murals so hopefully like i said unfortunately the past two years it's been challenging with COVID not having an extra murals um but uh we've got a, a an amazing goal for next year and we've got a, a a couple of surprises up our sleeves okay so you know when my book leander when my book you've read it you've read my books and everything when this book was released i got a lot of um a lot of flack from um psychiatrists and everything because what happened was in when this book was published um there was an, uh, a journalist that wrote an article um, about the book, but never read the book, never read the book. Because I, on, on, a, on a radio interview, I spoke, 
Uh, I'm quite outspoken about medication, especially things like Ritalin Concerta, if it's not correctly diagnosed. And, you know, and because there's such overdiagnosis today, and for example, a teacher is not allowed to say that your kid has to go on Ritalin, it's criminal, you know, you can't do those things. And because the diagnosis that are done is not always done properly. Uh, uh, you know, a parent might hear that my child has to go on Ritalin, go to a normal GP, get a prescription and, and off they go. Mm. So, um, so uh, I, I got a lot of flag because in 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 any report and you built and everywhere there was a uh, an article that said that I say Ritalin is addictive and blah 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 blah. Okay, so there's a lot of people that jumped on the bandwagon and said, how can he say that? You know, it causes there's a lot of value to it. A lot of kids do so well on it, and of course that made the book sell like crazy, which which was great. Okay. And then eventually when I could actually, I let it go. I left it, you know, until people read the book. And then I had a time where, where I had my redemption. You know, I could actually go on radio and speak about it and everything. And, and because basically what the book says is what all the other psychiatrists and psychologists say. Um, because I, I want to believe that we're all on the same side and we all want to help. That's what I want to believe. Okay. But again, what, what I wrote in the book was, was that when it comes to things like learning barriers, dyslexia, dysgraphia, ADHD, you know, certain other diagnoses. I mean, we're going to talk a little bit about autism because both the schools, the one in Pretoria East and Alberton accommodates autism as well. It's always a holistic approach to, a, to get to a place of wellness. It took me years to understand it. I always thought that um, if I can have just that medication, it's going to fix me. Or if I do just this, that's going to, that's going to fix me. And often I found that parents always also wish for that silver bullet approach. You know, if you can just, if I can just, give my kid this, it's going to sort out everything. And, and what I found with my, with my journey is that there was a whole bunch of things I had to, to, to look at. I had to take care of the biological side of myself. I had to start taking great supplements. I had to start taking care of my sleep exercises. I had to grow spiritually. Faith was a big thing. You know, my, my relationship with my high power with God, um, of course. And then medication is also one part of that whole process. You know, diet is one part. Remedial schooling is one part of the whole process of getting to a place of wellness. For example, you know, discipline at home. You know, do the parents speak out of one mouth? Is there a father? Is there not a father? You know, what kind of structures? So there's a whole bunch of things that people need to look at. And I also assume that in, 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 in our case, that, that parents feel that, okay, I'm going to send my kids to creative kids or to a remedial school and it's going to sort out all my problems. You know, do you find that that is the case? Well, I think at times, um, look, I think the, the one thing is that parents, some parents come to us and they say, like, you are literally my last resort. We've tried everything. You know, we've been on medication. We've done therapies. It's now time to look at a different school. Um, you know, and, and I say exa exactly that to parents is when you enroll, understand and know that we are part of your team. We are a team of people that needs to work with your child. So, yes, the teachers form part, the school forms part. Um, medication might form part. And like you said, there's there's certain critical um, points where, where medication can be extremely valuable. And like you said, yes, it's not addictive, um, but it is something that we obviously look at once we've put therapies in place and if it's really necessary. And there's just such an overdiagnosis of so many different learning barriers and disorders. Um, and I think that's where medication got the bad rap. Um, it was the culprit and the blame because it wasn't really needed. And therefore, we work with amazing specialists. We work with neurodevelopmental practitioners. Um, we work with our, our psychologists. We work with our, our OTs. We work with our speeches. And as a team, it's important to work together um, and to put this in place for the child. So, um, you know, the one thing that I say to our parents is, you have your child at home and you experience their impulsivity, their, um, maybe it causes challenging behavior or maybe behavior that's, that you need to rectify the whole time. When you're in a remedial class, you have 16 learners <laughs> with impulsivity. You have 16 learners with different needs. So there's bound to be conflict at times, you know, between the learners. It's a normal school setting in that sense, you know. There is sometimes going to be a little bit of reaction. So we're not sitting here and saying that, 
that here's the moon in the sky and everything's all, you know, uh, starlight and twinkles. We hope for that. And obviously that we aim to provide as much as that as possible. But reality is, is that there might still be challenges. And, you know, even with therapies, it's a process. You know, I think our, our parents with learners that have grown with us, we had our first grade seven learners that started with us in grade one, um, leave the school this year for the first year. So that's very exciting. But how those parents have seen growth in their children, you know, how we've received feedback from other parents who our kids are in high school now that maybe started with us, you know, at a later grade, come back and say, my child is coping in mainstream high school in a smaller class, so in a private school, for example, but with the full curriculum, and they are reading, they are flourishing, and they started with us, for example, and they couldn't read, or they couldn't, you know, um, they didn't have good executive function. So it's always good to hear that progress. But at the same time, our parents need to, you know, take hands with us. And, and it's really effort from everyone. But I think the amazing thing about it is that the parents are not on their own team. Whereas a parent, when you come to Creative Kids, we form part and all of a sudden you don't just have two hands, you have 20 hands, um, you know, that form a, a team. And like you said, it's very important for the kids at home to understand when mom and dad speak, um, you know, we do have obviously parents that are single moms or single dads and, you um, at the end of the day, you know, helping to see how we can take hands. Because when my teacher and my parents are on the same page and my therapists are on the same page, there's no way, you know, that the child can't see improvements and, and, and can't do really well. Let's talk a little bit before I start answering a few questions. So before you can start answering a few questions, let's talk a little bit about aut um, autism. Um, autism is, is, is a, is can be quite a challenging thing. There are various degrees of autism. Of course, the school in Alberton, you guys are doing incredibly well. And now in Pretoria East, the school is in Gersfontein, just by the way. So we'll send you guys all the details. Please just go and have a look at the school. It's beautiful. It's brand new and it's just wonderful. Um, but uh, but talk, talk to us a little bit about accommodating kids with autism. So, um, yeah, so two years ago, we started our, which, which we termed the, and I was thinking about what name do we give our, our special needs class or our OSIN class, if you want to call it that. Um, and, you know, I said, well, these learners are very special, but in, 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 a, in a good way special. They are little superstars as well. So we called them our SRC, our special remedial class. And in these classes in Alberton, we have two. So we have a grade R to one class and then we have a about a grade one to two class um, so we accommodate learners with um, autism that fall on the autism spectrum but that are high functioning so I think that's that's one of the important things is that um, uh, it's autistic learners that fall on the spectrum that have got a good um, high functioning uh, cognitive ability and a low support need. So what that means is that you get different levels of support on the autism spectrum. Um, so when they are on a low support needs, it means that they can, um, you know, they can help themselves when they need to be able to do stuff. So they are mobile and they are cognitively able. Um, a lot of them have quite severe language difficulties, processing sensory difficulties, but the support that they need is low support. So they cope very well on um, uh, occupational therapy, speech therapy, and the classes are also smaller. There's only 12 in a class and we have a teacher and an assistant in those classes. So we are really growing on that stream and we hope to open a separate campus for our SRC section under the Creative Kids umbrella um, to have their own campus as well so that we can actually accommodate um, a, a lot more grades because now we only accommodate grade R to grade two. And yes, in Pretoria, we have opened our SRC class, uh, class that will start next year um, and that'll be also a nice small class that that hopefully will grow into a complete separate campus so ideally i think our goal and our dream for that section is to have our remedial stream of, of primary schools but also then to have our our src stream of their own campus where we have the different grades for the learners um, that are high functioning autistic and oh, it's so amazing when you walk into the class and i speak to my interns psychologists um 
when our qualified psychologists, they are just incredible. Um, and our teachers that are amazing. And you see these children develop. And where in the beginning of the year, you walk in and they can only point to what they want. And at the end of the year, they speak and they, you know, they are blending sounds and they are reading. Um, so that is really incredible to see. So we are extremely excited about our SRC um, section under the Creative Kids umbrella as well. Thank you, Leander. So before I just open this for, for, for questions, I just want to say, so about two weeks ago, I went to the Alpton campus and I went and said hello and the, the head boy and the head girl was um, greeted me at the door and oh, it was just so beautiful and clean and wonderful. And, and um, I received testimonies from the parents about their kids. Now, of course, you know, it's, um, it's like we don't want to blow our own horn, but the things that I read about where the kids were and what the school did for them, especially the idea of, of enforcing life and love over them so that these kids can kind of go through the schooling system believing that there's nothing wrong with them, but that they are worthy and that they're amazing and that they're achieving and that they can have the confidence to when they do leave creative kids at grade seven, that they can probably go to a mainstream school and continue there, but that they grow up with that idea of, you know, the identity of that I'm not a failure, that there's nothing wrong with me. Because the moment that happens and you start growing up with that belief system, what happens is your subconscious mind will always find evidence of to support your belief system. And that's kind of what happened with me, you know. My grade three teacher used to tell me that like a lump. So she wrote on my card, you know, in in uh, in sports, a biggie lump. And um, and every single time I did sport, and I didn't, you know, I was second last or third last, or I didn't score a try, it would reinforce that belief that I am clumsy. And of course, that led to my entire um, teenage years in school of not giving my all with sport. Only years later, I realized what a good long distance athlete I am. I went into amateur boxing. I graded as a record boxer. So of course, when you get older, you've got to then break through those belief systems. And that is so what is so challenging. So there's a lady here that asked, um, it was the first question. Uh, her name isn't there. It's from a Galaxy A31 phone. So if you can just type in quickly at the bottom there, what is your name? Um, and the, the first question, there's a reason why I want your name. There's a reason. The <laughs> first, so Galaxy, she just put up her hand. I don't know what, what her name is. Let me just see it quickly. Let me just go down. Um, it's not Katinka. Oh, apologies, I need to leave. That's Shannon. Oh, Rihanna. Rihanna, that's you. Um, Shannon, no, no worries. We'll send you the recording. Thank you very much for something. We've got a recording for this. Okay, so uh, Rihanna. Rihanna asks, is there a plan for a high school? And that's the question that a lot of people get. Yeah. So I think at this, you know, in this point of time and, and the whole reasoning and the whole um, drive behind creative kids is that we want to remediate. So um, often parents come to us and they say, our kids are doing so well, you know, don't you want to open a high school? Um, and there's, there's, a challenge that comes with a high school in terms of offering all the different subjects. And I think that's the one thing in life that we never want to do is to limit our kids. And, um, you know, so there is, there are, but more complications with regards to opening a high school, being able to have the, the, the staff and the manpower to have all the different subjects available for the learners, especially because we are a small cottage school. And our promise to our parents is that we will never be big. We won't have big campuses with a thousand learners learners because that takes remedial out of remedial we will always be a, a, a cottage feel um, and I think from from our side we've always tried to provide structure so our kids wear school uniform we have a school timetable so we are as close to a mainstream school that you can find um, and we try to remediate so to answer that in a nutshell not in the near future um, you know we'll see what God plans for us but at this stage we really want to focus on primary school and doing it really good and and remediating but what we do offer is in grade seven we are 
assess the learners. Our psychologist assesses the learners and we help the parents with placement. So we then identify and, and see and, and help the parents to say, your child would be able to, or we, we're quite positive that they would be able to cope in a mainstream setting, maybe a private school setting, or these other specific schools in our areas that we identify that we then refer to, um, whether it be government or private schools. But again, specifically for now, for example, our grade seven learners, um, we refer to about six different schools and all the learners were referred to different schools because of their strengths, um, you know, and what they want to want to do and, and where their strengths are. So yeah, I think that's, that's the answer for that one. Um, so not in the very near future, but, who knows? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Leander. Thank you, Rihanna. Okay, this is from Katinka uh, Kalinka Potritra. I hope it's Kalinka, not Katinka. It says here Kalinka. Um, so Kalinka just wrote you. Um, Kalinka, I can really so I can really res resonate and um, and relate with what you're asking because that kind of I was that kid. She says she's got a 12-year-old boy. He was diagnosed with ADHD at a very young age, as well as dyslexia. Um, he's in a mainstream school at the moment. He also takes Ritalin and um, they're waiting to, to be, um, she's on a, on a waiting list for another school uh, at Jan Krill. The kid or her son doesn't cope at all. He's got emotional outbursts and uh, uh, especially in the class. And, um, and yeah, it's just, she writes, it's, 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 it's literally, it's a, it's a nightmare at the moment. Um, she's a single parent. The father is not there. Um, the father's not uh, around anymore, and that makes it very difficult as well when you're a single parent and you're a mother. And, of course, the kid wants a father as well, you know. Um, the father was diagnosed with bipolar, and she's scared that kind of genetically, you know, he's also going to have bipolar. Um, she's got a few questions here, but she says, um, first of all, how often does the assessments being done with the kids at the school? By the psychologists okay so the kid is in the school of course just talk about quickly under the assessment prior because we do give free assessments and it's very important for us to place the kid correctly because not all kids will fit the creative kids you know system but so talk a little bit about that and then of course um you know do the, the assessments is it an ongoing thing at the school and then also what are the fees at the school because i think we need to talk about that yeah so we do an enrollment assessment. So when you apply at Creative Kids, our educational psychologists do an enrollment assessment. So what that is, is it's an academic assessment. It's not an IQ test. It's not a, a full psychoeducational assessment. It is an academic screening assessment that the child doesn't need to study for um, and a bit of a fine motor assessment as well, perceptual assessment. So we basically see where your child is at. Um, to obviously also see, you know, what curriculum, will they be able to cope with our curriculum? But most importantly, it is to help us so that when your child enters the school, um, that we know uh, where to help them. So instead of us waiting a full term to see where your child is struggling or what we need to put in place, we already do that at the onset. So our, in, uh, also our psychologists and our interns then prep the teachers and they have weekly support sessions with the teachers on how they can support your specific child and then um, also to say well this child is coming to your class next week this is what you can expect and this is what you already need to work on so when that child enters the classroom our teachers know exactly you know what to expect um, you know and what they need to help with so that's maybe to answer that question ongoing assessments yes we do but um, so a full a full psychoeducational assessment just very briefly um, is an assessment that covers an IQ test an emotional test a scholastic test, a perceptual test. So it's an extremely comprehensive assessment, but that is something that is outsourced and parents do that privately and they pay for that privately with psychologists. Um, when we identify that a child needs a concession, for example, like an exam concession, whether it be extra time or a reader, a reader or an oral exam, and the parents do not have medical aid or the funds available, then we put those children onto a list and our psychologist will then assist them um, and assess them free of charge. So there's obviously also a certain amount that we can do every year 
just due to the, you know, the, the full schedules that they have, but we do do that for parents. Um, we offer free uh, therapy to parents that are, that's done by our intern psychologists. So parents who can't afford therapy or um, parents who, you know, can't outsource the therapy in terms of emotional therapy and behavioral therapy, we then offer at the school. So that's an additional um, add on, but all occupational therapy and speech therapy is privately paid because um, unfortunately that is not covered in the school fees. So we do allow the, the OTs and the speeches to come onto our school premises free of charge and they can then use our facilities. We have lovely therapy rooms um, and they can use that on the school premises. So the child in the school day, the parent doesn't have to travel. They can then have their therapy at school, which is great. It really helps a lot for traveling as well for parents. So that's with regards to the assessment. And then we do a yearly assessment with all our learners, which is a, an academic screening. We do reading and writing and spelling tests. Um, with a psychologist to see on what level they are. And obviously we wanna see that there's progression and also that helps us to put the correct intervention in place. And I can honestly say our teachers and our psychologists work very hard. Um, they are very passionate. And you know, when I sit in supervision with my interns and they get all excited and emotional because they see the growth in the kids, that's when you know it's not a psychologist that's there for the sake of being a psychologist, but one that with passion and the same with our teachers. They're there because they really have a passion. Um, with regards to the fees, so our fees differ from campus purely because of the, um, the, the overheads and the, the area that the school is in. Um, so the school fees have got different packages for different areas, depending on where you want to place your child um, also. Um, but the school fees range between 4,000 and 4,500 Rand a month. Um, and like I said, that then obviously includes the support from the psychologist. It includes the remedial education. It includes the smaller classes, um, the multi-sensory lessons. So a lot of our tools and our equipment that we use in the class, we expect our teachers to do multi-sensory lessons, meaning that they need audio, they need visual, they need kinesthetic, they need sand, they need this, they need that. And those are things that we then purchase from the, from the school fees as well. And when we have projects, so the little fundraisers that we have, that's to cover the clay in the classes and all of those things. Um, but in general, that's what the school fees are like. And, um, you know, when we, I think that's also one of the things that really make us different is that when parents compare school fees from different remedial schools, I mean, for the majority of it, about 80% to 90% of remedial schools um, range from 8,000 to 20,000 Rand per month. So we literally come in at lower than half price, you know, um, and, and I think that's really where our heart is, is that we identified and see um, that there's children that need it. But the parents, we don't all have that, you know, to have 10 grand just lying around every month to pay for school fees is not in anyone's pocket. And I think that's where creative kids, you know, that's also where our, our school fees um, vision and mission comes in is that we want to provide good quality, solid education on a remedial level, um, but that is affordable. Yeah. Sure, Leander. It's um, it's really incredible. Um, I just want to quickly say to the to the um, audience out here that um, Leander's got a, two incredible practices. The one is in Waterkloof in Pretoria, um, with a whole team as an educational psychologist, as well as in Alberton. So, if you want any information concerning that, please just um, um, send us an email on info at creative kids with a z dot org dot z a info at creative kids .org.za if you want to get hold of her as well. Um, I just want to read you quickly. Chantal says here, my daughter is doing so well at your school. She has become a new person with such much confidence, so much confidence. That's incredible. So I just want to answer this last, do this last question. And I suppose this is going to really, um, a lot of people have asked this. Um, oh, so, so, yeah. So, so a lot of people want to know, Everybody says, you know, is there going to be a campus in, in the Western Cape? Is there going to be a campus in Hotepus Badam? Is there going to be a campus in, you know, in, in, in Cape Town? Is there going to be a campus? So, so where, where do you see creative kids going, Leander? Um, you know, there's a, a huge need for people across South Africa for creative kids and for what it is that we do. So what is the vision? So I think it was up to me tomorrow morning, I would wake up and open 100 campuses and, and you know, have, have so many children enroll and just, you know, just see their progress and, and change their lives. 
Um, but it's definitely our vision to open more campuses. But one thing that I can vouch for is that when Creative Kids does something, we do it properly. We do it in quality and not in quantity. Um, we, we will get to quantity and have more camp campuses. But we open a campus one at a time and we make sure that that camp campus is fully functional, fully equipped, um, you know, have the best teachers and the best services, and then we open a new one. So I think in the very near future, our aim is to open a campus every year um, and, and really, you know, settle and, and open more as time goes by. So, yes, I think our, our goal and our dream is to have a creative kids in all the areas across the country um, where, where our kids can and just find, you know, their new home. Awesome. So there's the, the email address, info at creativekids.co.za. So the three people that have asked the questions, we've got Rihanna, we've got Kalinka, and um, the last person that have asked the question was... Um, Who's the last person that asked the question? Hold on quickly, hold on. Um, Marlette Curtis, because she was asking about, you know, whether there's going to be campuses, you know, anywhere else. So for the three of you, we're going to be sending a free copy of the book. I've got three books that I'm going to be sending to you guys. Um, so if you can please do me a favor and just send me your details to that email address, info at, um, at Creative Kids uh, with a Z dot org dot I'll get all your details and I'll post it to you on my own costs. Um, cost. And um, so with that, really, we want to say, um, Leon, is there anything else on your heart that you would like to share um, uh, about Creative Kids? I think we're going to go into, you know, December months. We all, um, we all deserve a great rest. And of course, these kind of Zoom calls we're going to be having on a quarterly basis, sometimes more, sometimes less, uh, depending on 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 um, on everything, um, on a whole bunch of things. But you know, I want to say thank you for everybody that have listened. And if you if you want any, um, you know, if you want any information, uh, everything is really, um, uh, you know, it's confidential. If you send, I know a lot of these things can be highly personal. Um, and um, so please send your, your names and, you know, and your questions to info at creativekids.org.za and we'll get back to you. Um, if any one of you want to get in touch with me as well, you can also email info at creativekids.org.za. They'll get in touch with me. You can leave your telephone number, your email address, and we can, we can chat. I, I love building relationships with people, especially the parents of the, of the children at, um, at Creative Kids and people that are in need of, of different solutions. There are a lot of things that you can do for your child that you might not know, you know, that you might not know that will help. Um, and there's, there's a lot of solutions out there. So with that, I want to say good night, Leanna. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure everybody's got a lot of a lot more questions. Sometimes people are afraid to ask questions on Zoom. Um, but please, the, the, the three people that have asked these questions, the ones that have answered, send your details. I would like to just post you a little Christmas gift. Um, and um, and Julianda and the team, we really honor you. You know, your heart, your love, just the price of what, you know, the cost of having a kid in Creative Kids. I know schools where I, some of my friends send their schools to, to primary schools that are 12 and a half, 13,000 rand a month. And the prices are going to go up next year. And, you know, as you say, not everybody have those funds. Um, but a lot of the normal average mainstream government schools are going up to two and a half thousand rand a month now. So the value that kids will get from it, I, want, I really want to say thank you. And thank you for allowing me to be part of this team. Thank you to all the teachers that's on this call, the staff and Ryan and everybody. Um, we're looking forward. We've got our year end function on the 10th of December. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that, to spend uh, the afternoon with everybody. So with that, thank you, everybody. Thank you for, for plugging in and really send, send our info to the parents and the people and the friends that you know that are going through these struggles. A lot of people are going through these struggles. And as soon as people get this information and they kind of know what to do, that's when people take action. And there's a whole bunch of awesome solutions that we can provide. So with that, we want to say God bless. Take care. There is a recording. I'm going to send the recording to Leander. And um, I'm also going to keep the recording. So if you want to get all of it, just please email and we'll send you the recording. God bless. Take care. Leander, thank you very much. Enjoy thank your you. evening.
Thank you, everybody. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.